I and you and all of us can fall into that trap when we do feel like we have something to prove of not showing up so free. And one of the ways we can accomplish hiding is by pushing down on our vocal cords, not just so that the pitch is lower, but so that we get really monotone. And then we end up sounding like somebody who is unknowable. You cannot tell how I really feel about something. Welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to a Visible Voice. Reveal and define your voice to speak your truth through the power of podcasting. And I'm your host, Mary Chan. So, 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 let's go. Hello, this is going to be a good one. This is episode number 63. Permission to speak to redefine the sound of power with Samara Bay. The voice you have today is not what you were born with. Things change based on your community, who you grew up with, not just within your core family and who you live with, but also the media, society, everyone around you, teachers, friends, enemies. I remember as a kid trying new words when I would hear somebody else say it and just wonder, does this fit with what I'm trying to say? And how did they say it? Can I say it the same way or in a different tone? Mostly because I looked up to them. They were older than me usually, and I wanted to be liked. I wanted to see if it fit who I was at the time. So growing up, your voice becomes a combination of your history and your feelings. Your sound is created from habits you've picked up over the years, whether you liked it or not, if you were aware of it or if it was all absorbed subconsciously, which is usually what happens. And then fast forward, you're a podcaster or you're hoping to launch a show soon, and you were probably told what sounds good or bad. Anyone whose voice that doesn't represent this societal norm, in the Western world especially, definitely knows this. I, for one, have been told many times about how I need to have a lower voice, or stop talking so fast, or I sound really young. You're so young. Oh, great, just because I talk way up here. All of that made me feel small and minimized because, well, I am small. I'm a tiny Chinese looking woman. They, the ones telling me these things, the authority figures in my life, they held the power. For generations, we've been taught how authority should sound, but that comes from a really old model that doesn't do us justice anymore. Things are changing. So come along on this episode to change along with it. I am so, 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 so thrilled, you'll hear it in my voice when I talk to her, to share with you one of my favorite speech coaches in the world. Samara Bay. Samara's clients range from candidates for U.S. Congress to C-suite executives, international diplomats, high school girls, and Hollywood celebrities. Her Penguin Random House book, Permission to Speak, is a revolution in how to think about your voice and everyone else's. It's out now, and I highly recommend you get yourself a copy after you hear what we talk about today. Samara and I nerd out on how to change what power sounds like, why other people's voices and words impact your own voice and what you can do to shift that narrative, and giving you permission to speak just like the title of her book and to do it with spirit through your heart voice. As Samara asks in this episode, dare I consider what it would mean to have a different relationship with my voice. I want you to think of that question as you listen in. Samara, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's like fangirl moment for me here. (laughs) (laughs) My absolute pleasure. I'm happy to talk with you. So... My background um, outside of working with podcasters, I started in radio 
20 years in the radio industry, being a little bit in front of the mic, but most of the work, I was behind the microphone. So creating commercials, directing voices, um, doing the voiceover work. And a lot of that time, and now in podcasting as well, it translates into it. People always say, oh, make me sound more professional. And I'm like, I get it. I get it. But why? Like, what is this professional, quote unquote, sound we're all trying to achieve here? Because in radio, the best radio hosts were always the ones that sounded just like themselves versus how, you know, you need to sound like this broadcaster and that broadcaster. And oh, my gosh, when I do this, I always put my voice in this lower register. Right. So when I heard about you and your podcast and your work, I was like, oh my gosh, this person is saying all the things in my head, but have actually like thought out all the words for it. (laughs) And so like the idea of the new sound of power, that whole phrase right there was like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I am thinking. So Tell me about the first time you were first inspired about this new idea of sound that you've created. You know, it's so funny. I don't actually remember when I first had the thought that that this is actually like a concept that I should sort of codify, right? The new sound of power. But the creeping sense that so many of us who should be sharing our ideas, who should be in leadership positions, who should be pitching our heart out and getting all of the money from the venture capitalists, you yeah. know, th- those of us who, sh- who should, who in a world that is fair, should be speaking in a voice that is free and clear and joyful and full of possibility are instead stifled by all of these old cultural stories about what powerful people are supposed to sound like. That was a creeping sense that I had literally from working with people. I mean, you know, part of my background is coaching actors. And then I had this moment that I I write about in chapter eight, right, where I was coaching Gal Gadot on Wonder Woman 2. I was in Washington, D.C. It was summer of 2018. And the U.S. was in this wild moment when we were two years into the presidency of that dude and we were hurtling towards our first midterm, which I think all of us, whether we were like professional activists or not, could sense was a real narrative moment. Like, can we rest the narrative back? And because of that, many, many, many first-time candidates were running for the 2018 midterms, but they also didn't necessarily know how to do the campaign part of it, right? Campaigning is a lot of things. Part of it is asking for money. Part of it is speaking to large crowds, right? Part of it is figuring out their policies and what they stand for. And I was thrown headfirst into this because this really cool organization in the U.S. called moveon.org that finds excellent candidates and offers them various kinds of support found me and said, would you be willing to, you know, be one of these arms of support? And I realized when I was working with these women who are running for office that that last thing I said, the policy, the where they stand, that they were golden on. But how to talk about it in a way that brings people in and isn't all about their completely understandable insecurities when on a big stage, that was the challenge. And for most of us, even those of us who are professional voice people, right? When we're in a high enough stake situation, all of the dormant stories come alive again. And the stories are from our own childhood. The stories are from our culture at large. And this is why we need this cultural reckoning of what power is supposed to sound like. Because many of us take for granted, there is one way to sound powerful. You lower your voice like yeah. you just did, <laughs> right? You try to go for quote unquote professional. And the word professional in this case is both a stand-in for like the norm, just, you know, kind of a neutral. I'm not saying that it's bad or good. It's just the norm, in, especially in, in a journalism context, right? There's sort of a normal way that people are trained to speak in a like lawyer prosecutorial environment. It's slightly different, but again, there's a norm in science, the way that scientists speak to each other on big stages. There's a norm, right? None mm-hmm. of this is good or bad. It's just that this is how subcultures form, right? There's yep. things that are normal and there's things that are deviations from the norm. And then the other part of the word professional is a container word, I think, for patriarchy, white supremacy, right? All the ways that our our systems are set up to say that certain people deserve to have more power than other people, and we'll keep it that way by allowing access only to people who sound a certain way. 
when I got really clear on that part of it, that, that speaking about voices is a social justice issue, it became like an inevitable, you know, okay, I have to go there now. Like, this is now the thing. This is now the thing. So really from coaching those 2018 candidates, I realized so much about how many of our brains work and what a mess it is to try to unpack. Well, then how am I supposed to show up in these high stakes moments in a way that both gets me taken seriously and also feels good? Is it possible for two things, those two things to be happening at once? How do we reconcile that? Oh, yes, exactly. And two things can happen at once. Well, yeah, you know, I'm a coach. So like, fortunately, you know, this isn't just a theoretical conversation. This is actually like, okay, but for the person in front of me, you know, what works? Yeah. And in all the work that I do, I always point back to the question, like, how do you want your listener to feel? And I feel like the feelings part is missing a lot in the the voice part when people are, you know, coming to us and they're like, oh, I, you know, I want to get rid of my ums or I want to, you know, sound quote unquote professional. But uh, the question I always ask people is, you know, how do you want your listener to feel? And I think that mainly comes up because when I was a little girl, I like you were saying stories, right? I grew up being the youngest of three in a traditional Chinese household to immigrant parents. And so I was told to, you know, look pretty and stay over there. And I was this tiny, tiny little person. Like, you know, we can't see each other over podcasting, but I'm like five foot one, five foot two, I would like to say on my license, but, you know, I'm stretching it. And I'm just, I've always been small. And so people had always put me into this little box of small, cute little girl. I was just told, you're small, you're cute, you know, you don't have feelings. And then when I go into radio school, um, we're told to, you know, you are only supposed to talk to one person. And this one person was just always about demographics. You know, how old are they? Um, You know, what gender are they? But they never had feelings. They never had full-fledged feelings. And I feel like that's always been missing in that nuance of talk about voice And so I loved in your emotions chapter that you address the word authenticity and how you wrote that, as you say, quote, its meaning has become murky. (laughs) Such a great word, first of all, for that. But secondly, in the podcasting space, the word is so overused. And I mean, it's good to have a word there so that we can talk about the use of feelings and emotions in our voice. But yeah, it is just so overused in, in our world. And so how... Well, actually, sorry. Yeah, you can ask a question, but I have so many thoughts okay. about what you just said. Okay. <laughs> uh, so what does authenticity mean to you? Well, what I'm hearing in what you're setting up, which is so cool and so useful, I think, for all of us, is this is a little reductionistic, but I'm, I'm going to say it, the old way of approaching how any of us might speak into a microphone is thinking about ourselves. How do I sound? How shall I come across? And even the word authentic in this case is about that. How should I come across like the meest version of me possible? The new, again, old and new, it feels like a little bit of a, a oversimplification, but I'm, I'm, I'm offering it. The new way of thinking about how any of us might approach a microphone that you're offering is connecting to our listener. And making it not about ourselves, but literally our actions, how we want them to feel is, well, what do we want to do to them? And then it's not about who we are, which raises these impossible questions about which one, which version of us is the real us. Right. And instead makes it about connection. Which version of me matters for this conversation, even if it's only one-sided, to happen? How do I transmit the things I want to talk about? in a way that makes it matter to my listener. And if it doesn't, and if I don't care, then don't do it. So there's even like built into it, you know, a litmus test of like your purpose. But I will say to answer your question more directly, authenticity, I think all of us know, is uh, meant to be a word to capture some spirit of truth. It is an attempt at getting at something that feels true rather than something that feels fake. So, you know, to tie it back into what we were talking about with the professional voice, right? Like the benefit of a taking on a professional voice that suddenly sounds like everyone who has ever spoken before yes. in a power position, right? The benefit of it is you signal instantly to your listener, you should take me seriously. 
The drawback is you don't sound like you. You don't sound like a whole human person with a heart. You sound generic. You sound like you have done the work to make yourself generic, which is a way of breaking trust with your listener. So this is the kind of like modern media training that I think you and I are inside of, where we go, sometimes, I say with pure love, sometimes, we have to just jump straight to, how do I signal as quickly as possible, take me seriously? Okay, I'll just try, I'll do that old thing. (laughs) Yes. And sometimes, the more and more we have a little bit of power or platform or privilege, really, we get to experiment a little bit with, how do I let some of that go? worry less about other people taking me seriously, quote unquote, and instead step into the type of leadership where I have decided that going for connection, that making the person on the other end not necessarily take me seriously, but feel seen is a higher goal. I love how your book really is broken down into like all the aspects of voice coaching, like each chapter, you know, breath, and tone and pitch and size and all of that stuff. But you leave words until chapter seven. Isn't that wild? Yeah. I mean, you know, I even joke at the top of chapter seven, like, oh, (laughs) (laughs) oops, there's also words. (laughs) You know, world in podcasting, a lot of people are so hyper-focused on words. So I love that you, you leave it to like later, like, let's not focus on that quite yet. Here are some more important concepts. I also feel like when podcasters are talking about words, it's more of like a symptom of maybe a bigger challenge or issue that's happening. Like when you have a cold, you know, you might have like a stuffy nose or a cough, but really that's just a symptom. And so the root of the stuffy nose, let's address what that is actually. So why did you choose not to talk about words until much later in your book? I think that's right. I mean, first of all, First of all, on a practical level, this book is just not about telling people what to do. So how could you actually, how could anybody actually tell people what words to use, right? Right, So there was was an intrinsic issue with having any chapter, whether, where, no matter where it goes on words, because the reality is so many different types of people are reading my book from so many different industries with so many different goals. You know, each of us is so unique and the next job in front of us and the next one is different for each of us. So it's not like you're, you're going to find in the words chapter, like these are the words to use, right? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So what is the point of a words chapter in a book about how we communicate? Well, honestly, it's about our own relationship, each of our own personal relationships to our own sense of how articulate we are, how much we can trust that the right words will come out in the right order when the stakes are high. And that in a way, isn't about the words either, right? So even the chapter on words isn't really about words, but is about how we reconcile ourselves to the reality that I don't think anyone talks about, not enough at least, that communication is not about finding the right words. Communication is about trying out some collection of words in the moment for the ears that are listening, and then in complete good faith, saying, or without words saying, did those words work? If not, I've got others. And then communicating is, you know, a dance. It's a, it's a collaboration. It so is. And I find so many people are like, oh, but I got have to find like this word needs to go with that word. And, and then I'm going to end the sentence. And I'm like, but do we speak in sentences? Like, wh- where do you ever say period? <laughs> For sure. For sure. And look, inside of this, of course, I don't mean to be flippant because inside of this is, again, an opportunity to look at, you know, the the swirling power dynamics, the social justice component of, well, why is this word, quote unquote, articulate so loaded? Because if you don't sound like somebody who traditionally has power, by which I mean your accent codes for race or class in a way that, you know, we, we try to pretend doesn't exist in, you know, American and Canadian culture, and yet it's all around us, then being articulate, meaning putting fancy words together in a classy order, I don't know, I made that phrase up, but whatever, something like that, <laughs> is a way to cut through the potential biases. So being articulate is a big deal in terms of trying to get taken seriously. Again, we're in the trying to get taken seriously, you know, part of the conversation. But there's a lot of things that complicate that. One of them is 
wouldn't it be nice to just name the biases and give yourself a break so you don't have to try to make the words connect to each other in a way that makes the other person's ears realize they should take you seriously? Like, you know, can we just name that that's like a really annoying challenge to be up against every single day in, say, your workplace? Um, But also on more of like a somatic level, constantly trying to chase some version of yourself that you aren't is exhausting and does not lead to your best self coming out and the biggest impact you could possibly make. So what I'm really offering with the words chapter with this breaking down of the concept of articulate is as Barack Obama beautifully modeled for us with the phrase, yes, we can, which he borrowed from Dolores Huerta, but with the simplicity of yes, we can, rather than, you know, this long, ridiculous phrase that I made up in in that chapter that's full of uh, what we would call SAT words, right? Yes, we can is a reminder that often the simplest language is the best, is the clearest, is the strongest, is the most emotionally weighty, and says the thing in a way that is undeniable. And that often the multisyllabic words that are stand-ins for like, please take me seriously, I'm fancy, don't. And, you know, I'm an English major and I'm a Shakespeare nerd. So, of course, the caveat here is like, if fancy words make you feel delight, oh my God, of course. (laughs) Like, you know, words are our play in a way. But if they don't make you feel delight, if they if they trigger a sense of I'm trying to get taken seriously, please take me seriously. We are out of alignment. We are out of our power. It sucks. And it's bad communication. Yeah. And I I feel that because in the way I grew up, I had always thought that, oh, I am not an academic. So I am not an English major. I went to a radio school program. Like I didn't even, I didn't want to go to university because I felt like I was never that an academic because I didn't have the fancy words. But what, what I do now is realizing, well, I can't pronounce most of those fancy words anyway. And it, it tricks the tongue. Like I'm just tripping on myself all the time. So what's another way to say the fancy word that is just more to who I am? And so I offer that as well to, you know, the podcasters I work with. I'm like, don't try and write out your script and find the fancy word. But how do you say it? That uh, goes back to, I guess, what we were saying before, the authenticity that is more you and that really makes you come alive. It doesn't matter what the word is. Totally. And, you know, sometimes there are delicious words that are so specific, that so do what you want them to do. And you find them and you hold on to them and you go, Ooh, when I talk about what I do, I'm going to remember to use that word because it always like real, you know, like, but that's because you've found a relationship with that word. You're not using it for someone else. You're using it for you. And if you are using it for someone else, it's for them to feel things, not for them to take you seriously. Right. So this is the other part of that chapter is about having a visceral relationship to words which, I mean, I guess I should say having an acting background was actually something that we were trained in. And I know that most people weren't. So it's also a place to sort of offer that, that we can, you know, use that great to almost 200 year old poem. We are the music makers because we are the music makers and we are the dreamers of dreams, wandering by lone sea breakers and sitting by desolate streams, world losers and world forsakers upon whom the pale moon gleams. But we are the movers and shakers of the world forever, it seems. And when we can say that, or obviously anything that we've memorized, and go, you know, world losers and world forsakers on whom the pale moon gleams, you know, it's just poetry. Like we can make it mean whatever we want it to mean, but choosing to make it mean something and allow the sounds coming out of your mouth to connect to that meaning, to connect to your heart, connect to emotion is not just something our bodies are set up to be able to do. Although many of us have many years of experience avoiding doing that, but also almost a obligation certainly an opportunity, but I think a responsibility. If we're going to be the ones speaking and other people are going to be listening on a stage or on a metaphorical stage to own the words coming out of your mouth. You know, there are so many points in your book that my copy is flagged. I'm just going <laughs> to, this is all the, the little post oh notes. <laughs> That's the greatest sound. <laughs> 
But okay, so after writing all of your thoughts down, you're, you're publishing it into the world earlier this year, doing the book tour. What is the main courageous conversation that we're not having right now? You know, you've written it all down, but is there something that you still you want to highlight more of? For some people, and maybe, you know, those of you listening, you're feeling this, you hear this and you go, oh, yes, finally, right? Kind of like Mary, your, your reaction, right? Oh, finally, we get to have this conversation. But for so many of us, it's really the first time that we've been allowed to think that hating our own voice could be solved or is a worthy endeavor because part of living in this, you know, <laughs> patriarchal white supremacist capitalist colonial culture is to go hating my voice is normal. End of story. Don't put any effort mm, there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the courageous conversation for me to be having, but also for all of us to be having inside our own heads is dare I take that on? Dare I consider what it would mean to have a different relationship with my voice and to honor that there's a whole new set of possibilities for me, for any of us. If we like the sound of our voice, or if we even just feel neutral about it, and if we approach public speaking opportunities from a perspective of love rather than fear, because that's the other part of hating your voice is fearing using it. And I don't only mean in this sort of politicized way where we say, use your voice, although obviously I, I'm here for that as well. But I mean, even in, in more self-advocacy or community advocacy, right? Or talking about your idea in a meeting like it deserves to be heard. And that's really what's at stake when we're talking about our relationship to our voice. It's like our relationship to how we be out loud every day, and especially when the stakes are high and our life could be changed by how we show up or hide. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm going to switch gears a little bit now to specifically more podcasting. And so I originally found you down the rabbit hole of podcasts and your podcast with the same name of the book, Permission to Speak. You know, you have this knowledge and experience with the literal voice, but now you are behind the microphone with this podcast. What parts of creating a podcast were challenging for you? Oh, I love this question. Um, okay, I'm jumping back, you know, over three years now and not just three years, but three very formative years for me. I pitched the podcast four years ago, March of 2019 to iHeartRadio. They bought it in the room. I went hard on like, there's no podcast about the voice on this medium that, you know, celebrates the voice. And then there was a year of whatever, like things taking a long time in the, you know, massive corporate world that is iHeartRadio. And I, we finally launched it February of 2020, which of course was seconds before the pandemic. So my in-studio um, interviews were uh, limited and it became a home operation. And then March of 2020, so just a few weeks into the launch of the podcast, and I had a few episodes banked, I pitched my book oh, wow. and it sold and the clock started ticking on the book. And of course, also, you know, as with many of us, I lost all my childcare and we were in lockdown. Yes. And, you know, it was a bizarro time. So in the midst of all that, I was recording this podcast and learning, as you suggest, a huge amount about my own voice. And I don't really just mean the sounds, right? I kind of never just mean the sounds. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean um, my relationship to how I sound when I'm talking as an expert, right? And part of, you know, the gamble that I'm interested in for the quote unquote new sound of power is that expertise does not have to sound like it comes from some serious stentorian, you know, authoritative voice in order to get taken seriously. We can still be playful and we can still swear and we can still, you know, have uh, lived the life we've actually lived up until this moment and also have collected the great wisdom that we have. And what if those things all, you know, come out in how we talk? And I have to say, I got there off and on throughout my podcast, but I also didn't off and on. I think I really started out and, you know, I start one of my chapters actually honoring what a mess I was at the microphone my very first time interviewing someone who was totally intimidating to me. And 
the producers couldn't really tell. The iHeart folks were like, yeah, great job for an early podcaster, you know, for a virgin podcaster. <laughs> great job. And I was thinking to myself, I have notes. <laughs> <laughs> Because I could tell that even though I'm me and I know what I know about how we fake our voice to try to sound more generic, I nonetheless was doing it. My nervous system, my, my body's fear mode was doing it. And so I'll tell you more specifically what I mean by that. I was going into more of a monotone. Mm. So not just pushing down on my vocal cords as uh, many women do in order to sound uh, lower pitched whole chapter on pitch. And, and that's also, you know, obviously related to that voice that you gave us earlier, yeah. the, uh, you know. <laughs> so it's not just now I'm a serious person, so I speak with a lower pitch, but also I shave off all the weirdness. I shave off all of the unpredictability, my sense of humor, my, you know, sense of whimsy, the things that uh, are so uniquely me, I, I can't even name them, but they're how I show up when I'm talking to my favorite people around whom I have nothing to prove. And I and you and all of us can fall into that trap when we do feel like we have something to prove of not showing up so free. And one of the ways we can accomplish hiding is by pushing down on our vocal cords, not just so that the pitch is lower, but so that we get really monotone so that everything that we say sounds like this. And there's not really, sometimes it even goes into our throat and sounds like vocal fry, right? And then we end up sounding like somebody who is unknowable. You cannot tell how I really feel about something. Yeah, we're just hiding. We're just like, nope, don't, don't peek into this crack that I've started. Don't peek to. into yeah. this crack. Exactly. Exactly. Which made me realize, I think that aha happened actually when I was doing my podcast, that the opposite, using pitch variation. And I don't mean in some sort of, you know, clownish way where we're like, oh, it's rocking like that, right? <laughs> yeah. But just the actual pitch variation that emerges when we are feeling free. When we go up sometimes, we get excited and then we go down and we're feeling, I don't know, you know, conspiratorial. That kind of range inside of a single sentence and, and then also in, in, you know, larger waves as we have a conversation, that kind of range codes for vulnerability. I am willing to be seen is what we're saying inside of that kind of range. I'm willing for you to know me and to know not only who I am, but what I care about. Because vulnerability is all about, now you know how you can hurt me. I mean, that's the sad way of saying it, but it's true. Vulnerability is, these are the, these are the holes in my armor. But another way of putting that that's the, not a sad way of putting it is, if I tell you what I care about, now you know what I care about. In a way, that's like the deepest form of bonding. I'm willing to say, this matters to me. And I think that that actually, that phrase, that thought and the emotional component that goes along with it, I'm willing to say this matters to me like it matters to me. So now you know that is the absolute heart of the kind of communication that will change the world for ourselves, for all of us. And I know too, like when I was listening to your podcast, uh, you know, the, so many aha moments. And I think very similar to when I'm reading the book. And so, you know, if you don't have the book yet, please do get it. Permission to speak. Go find it at your favorite local bookshop. But also because we're podcasters, we love listening to podcasts. So this might be like picking your favorite child. <laughs> but of all the episodes that you have, which one would you recommend to a podcaster to uh, start listening to? It depends what you want and what you, you know, care about. If you're at all interested in politics, definitely the one with Elise Hoag, I-L-Y-S-E, Elise Hoag. She's a big deal in Washington and she's a friend of mine. And her advice on how to do this thing that in a way was what I was helping the moveon.org women with, you know, how to do this thing where you kind of scale up your life and then talk about it <laughs> is really helpful. And I quoted her in my book a bunch. But if you're interested more in just like this larger conversation about identity, how we kind of us ourselves out loud, the one that just popped up as a reminder to me is Sarah Jones, Sarah with an H, Jones. And she is a famous voice actor who does characters and has the Broadway shows and Meryl Streep has, you know, been a, a huge donor of her work. 
But she's also a black woman in America with a, you know, complicated multiracial, you know, growing up experience. And that comes out in both her conversation and also in her work. And I think it's such a like it's such a juicy way to enter into this conversation. Mm, okay. Those will be linked in the show notes so that we can all listen to them. Aww. And yeah, and be with you. You know, you, you're you're with us. Oh, by that. our sides I, love that. <laughs> I have to say since the book has come out I have gotten so many comments and you know notes from readers and from listeners oh my gosh I mean first of all it's like a better response than I dreamed of because I don't think I was allowing myself to dream that much Aww. about the response um that was a little too scary while I was like writing in isolation <laughs> during COVID yeah. you know but second of all, yeah, I think the big thing I am hearing over and over in different ways is that people are actually changing the way that they talk to themselves in their own head. Mm. And that is just really moving to me. You know, what can I say? It's so powerful. Thank you so much for writing the book, for creating the podcast, for the work, for you, for just being you. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. I always uh, end this question with all my guests, though. So last thing before you go, what are you most excited about podcasting right now? Okay, I have a few thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one, I would love to have a conversation with Brene Brown. So if I'm totally being honest, I'm excited about that. I just heard her talking about armor and the way she and I think about this is so related. But of course, hers doesn't necessarily talk about the, okay, but so what do we do when the stakes are high and the microphone is on us and we have to actually have our ideas from the inside come out? So I would love to have that conversation with her. But obviously just in general, I love that podcasting is a real breeding ground for the democratization of the voice. We are hearing so many different people talk in so many different ways, obviously many of whom are torn in this in-between place of how do I sound to get taken seriously, right? All those questions. But fortunately, also breaking through audaciously with, I'm just going to sound like me. And then that becomes the new norm. And that is stunning. And that the norm is not a single thing, but a diversity of things. That's really exciting to me. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. My absolute pleasure. At one time outside of this conversation, Samara said to me, when we change what power sounds like, we change who has it? Mic drop for me right there. And that right there is the essence of what this podcast is all about and what I do. That as podcasters, we have the ability to change what power sounds like. We've been told for too long that we don't matter. All these voices overpowering our own thoughts because of what should or should not be, you know, quote unquote should. And you know what? Listen back to this episode and listen to my voice specifically because of my excitement, because of our shared nerding out. I am more higher pitched. I speak faster on a roll with my enthusiasm. My voice was all over the place, but that was truly me in that moment. But that felt good, even though it might not sound quote unquote professional. It's not a good or bad thing. You know, both of those feelings can exist. It's something I picked up due to being the youngest in my family and literally the smallest person in the room for most of my life. I go back into that high-pitched sound and that is my enthusiasm. I have permission, and you do too, to sound the way that you do. Let your spirit guide your speech. Samara's idea of sounding like who you love is exactly what I talked about in episode 55 about finding your podcasting voice. And as she says, it's about caring out loud, using your voice to care. So if you haven't listened yet to episode 55, I suggest you go back to that one and go through those questions because I pose a couple questions for you to step into the power of your voice. That's a great starting point for you if you haven't checked that one out yet. So again, pick up Samara's book, Permission to Speak. Get the audiobook or do both 
It is so, so good. I have so many little flags and sticky notes in it, like I said in the episode. So I'll also have links to them in my show notes and to her podcast episode she mentioned as well. And remember that question I posed to you at the beginning of the episode? Dare I consider what it would mean to have a different relationship with my voice? What were your thoughts around that when we started? And now that you've heard the episode, what do you think about that now? Let me know by sending me a voice note at visiblevoicepodcast.com. There's the purple button, send voicemail. Or you can drop me an email. I love that as well. Visiblevoicepodcast at gmail.com. So actually, this is going to be the penultimate. Is that the word? Penultimate? The episode before the last episode before summer break. (laughs) So the next episode is the last one before I take my usual summer break. And I hope you do as well. And then we'll return in mid to late September. So until then, that'll give you lots of time to get Samara's book and read it over the summer. It's a great summer read. I highly recommend it. Okay, I'll chat with you next time. Thank you so much for listening to the Podcaster's Guide to a Visible Voice. If you enjoyed this episode, I'd love it if you'd share it with a podcasting friend. And to reveal more voicing and podcasting tips, click on over to visiblevoicepodcast.com. Until next time. Let's go.